Hey guys, welcome to the next and last video. So this is video 9.4. All right, so vocabulary, laissez-faire, literally means in French, allow to do. Uh, in government terms, it means hands off capitalism. All right, after capitalism, we're gonna talk about socialism. And after socialism, we're gonna talk about communism. So we're thinking this in terms of a continuum, all right? And what changes as the continu continuum goes on is the amount of involvement the government or the people have in the economy. So we're in the Industrial Revolution. Life is tough. Life is dirty. It's risky. It's nasty. So capitalism um, is what we're looking at here at the beginning. And there was this belief in laissez-faire which believe that if the government allowed free trade, then the economy would prosper. As long as the government doesn't get in the way, hey, don't bother them, they'll be okay. Adam Smith, uh, obviously the main economist who wrote a book called The Wealth of Nations, said there are three natural laws of economics. One, people look out for number one. Two, competition forces people to make a better product. And the laws of supply and demand, which we've talked a little bit about in class. And there's a famous philosopher named Thomas Malthus who argues there's one risk with um, capitalism at some point. Uh, population, the number of people, goes up more quickly than the resources. And at some point, there's not enough food. So people are destined to live a poor and miserable life. Um, Laissez-faire people say, nope, as long as the government stays out of the way, that basically the economy will sort that out and then did not want the government to help the poor workers. I mean, the advantage here being there's enough workers, make them work, the economy will go. Trade and industry are controlled by private owners. All right, buyers buy the stuff they want to make, buyers buy the stuff they want, producers make the stuff that they want to make to make a profit. In other words, the businesses run the economy and the government stays out of it. Does this sound familiar to you today? In other words, capitalism creates capital, money, lots of it. The question is for whom? What we see is as this capitalism is going along in America, some reactions to it. The workers figure out, wait, we don't have very much power as one. We as power as a group. They started creating labor unions, teachers in our labor union. I can't go to Mr. Losing and say, hey, give me more money. Our contracts are collectively bargained. Our union negotiates for all of us. What are they going to get? They want better pay. They want better working conditions. They want better hours. Um, they could go on strike. They just walk out. For a while, some governments actually outlawed unions, especially in America, because America was super laissez-faire. Eventually, the government gets involved and starts passing laws to protect the workers. There's other re reform movements. Uh, by 1833, Britain ends slavery. By 1865, in a little more controversial way, and the Civil War, America ends slavery. Uh, we start to see women getting rights by 1920 in America. And we're one of the latest countries for women to get the vote. There's going to be movements to clean up and fix public education and clean up the prisons. Again, what are the two things unions can do? Collect or to bargain and strike. Skilled workers wanted to basically have the most power because they're more important or more difficult to replace than the unskilled workers. These things often become violent. The bosses have thugs to beat up the strikers. It's not pretty. We see a series of reforms, especially in England and in America, to clean up the problems with women and children working and to make factories safer. All right. Horace Mann is the American who pushes for the idea of for a good, free public education. His idea was that the students should meet with a bunch of experts and basically create an assembly line. First period, second period, third period, etc. Et cetera, et cetera. And interestingly enough, again, 
We talk about the conversation to end slavery, right? <clears throat> and part of the argument for ending slavery was the threat it offered as cheap labor. Women start to get more rights. We talked about this. So if you didn't like capitalism, the next step was socialism. Um, and you see Jeremy Bentham, John Stuart Mill had this idea of utilitarianism. And they argue that the government should try to create the greatest good. So capitalism says no government. Zero percent. Socialism is going to say we want a little bit. We want socialism to use some government. Uh, we start to see we're going back to utopian ideas. And socialism is a belief that the government should plan the economy to prevent poverty and to promote uh, equality for everybody. Here you see some of those movements around America. An economic system which the factors of production owned by the public and operate for the welfare of all. Government should intervene. Government should get involved. Condemned capitalism, which they argued created a huge gap between the rich and the poor. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Socialism, they say, we're going to balance that out. Do you agree with the statement? The goal of society should be to bring the greatest good for the greatest amount of people. The next step, communism. No government, a lot of people. Socialism, a little bit of both. Communism is going to say, and there's a problem here we'll talk about in class, that the people, a.k.a. the government, should control everything. Karl Marx predicted that the workers would overthrow the owners of business. Karl Marx basically said, the history of the world is conflicts like our March Madness practice, and the next great conflict is going to be the workers against the bosses, and he was convinced the workers would win, and then once they won, that would create capitalism. He thought government would wither away as a classless society evolved because all the workers would see themselves as equal and everybody would share equally. In other words, my car wouldn't be my car. It would be the people car and whoever needed it could drive it. Um, communism never really takes hold or evolves, as Marx had hoped, because one, the gap's too big, and two, people are flawed and People are always going to have some sense of classes and differences, right? Blue, blue, right? So you see some of the famous communists of our lives. Um, and his idea is basically socialism take one step far further. Marx and Engels argue that there's always been class warfare and that eventually the proletariat, the workers, are going to take on the bourgeoisie. We base it on the idea of the rich and poor. Eventually, the gap's going to be so big, people are going to have all they can stand, and they can't stand no more, and there's going to be a revolution. The problem is, this really can't happen in the real world. People by nature are too selfish. Where people shared work and paid equally. Commune means belonging to all. All right, goal of communism get rid of classes and make everybody equal. So that person is equal, that person is equal, that person. You do work, you do whatever job you're good at, you help the people. All right. That's it, y'all. Last video. Please don't cry.